So good morning and welcome to today's presentation, Advancing Hospice and Palliative Care for Veterans. My name is Christy Grau and I'm the Value Management Lead for the Government and Pediatric Service Alliance for Get Well Network. During today's session, our presenter, Angie Fiorella from Get Well Network, will be presenting on behalf of Lebanon VA Medical Center and will share their, their experiences on hospice and palliative care. Being diagnosed with a disease that causes physical suffering or a terminal illness can be overwhelming for the patient and their family. The Get Well Inpatient platform delivers information, the similarities and differences between hospice and palliative care, so patients and their families are able to make informed decisions about how they want to be cared for. After hearing from our presenter, I will open up the floor to, to you all to ask questions and share your experiences with hospice, hospice and palliative care. With your participation, this session will provide a great opportunity to exchange ideas and best practices. It is my pleasure to begin this afternoon's presentation by introducing our presenter, Angie Fiorella. Angie is an oncology certified registered nurse and is the client service manager for Lebanon VA Medical Center. She has been a part of GetWell Network since 2018. Angie is also a committee member for Get Involved Now, a 501c3 charity whose mission is to meet the personal and emotional needs of cancer and pediatric patients, high risk pregnancy moms, and US veterans during life defining healthcare moments. Prior to joining Get Well Network, Angie spent five years working at Penn State Hershey Medical Center in a staff nurse cap capacity in both the Children's Hospital and Cancer Institute, and as an adjunct clinical instructor for Harrisburg Area Community College's nursing program. Before we get started, I need to share a, sh a disclosure statement with you related to nursing education credits that are being offered for this session. The Maryland Nurses Association is an accredited approver of continuing nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. If you wish to receive credit for attending this activity, you must complete the session survey found on your conference mobile app. In the survey, it is important that you check the box indicating that you would like to receive credit and enter your full name and e email address in the space provided. Your certificate will be sent to that address. In compliance with the Continuing Education Activity Credit Conflict of Interest Disclosure Requirements, we'd like to announce that the presenters of this session have no commercial association that would create a conflict of interest. Angie Fiorella will kick off our session today. Welcome, Angie. Hello, everyone. As Christy said, I am the CSM for Lebanon, but also a GetWell employee, so I will be presenting on their behalf. And you'll be able to tell that there's a little bit of a integration between the two teams, kind of explaining who Lebanon is and why we reached the point of developing the hospice and palliative care tile, and then also from a get well perspective. So for general facility information, we are located in Lebanon PA. Um, they have 188 total operating beds, but get well is in 116 patient locations. So at present, um, get well is in the emergency department, ICU, med surge, short-term rehab, CLC, and inpatient hospice. Um, this tile space is actually located in all 116 patient locations. Originally, when we were doing the build, it was meant to just be in inpatient hospice and then their general overflow unit, which is the short-term rehab. But as we go through this conversation, and you'll see too how difficult, even as clinicians, it is to talk about hospice and palliative care, we thought there is value in putting it in all patient locations because unfortunately death touches all of us and touches every unit within a hospital. Okay, so these two slides and this too, again, it just talks about how hard this conversation is. These are the two slides that I struggled the most with just trying to come up with talking points, but really it's just talking about the difference between hospice and palliative care. We as clinicians, um, as Christy explained, I prior to get well, I'm a bedside nurse and I spent four years administering chemotherapy on an outpatient basis, right? And before that, I worked in the children's hospital in the critical care unit. So I worked in both the NICU and I worked in PIMCU, and I saw death and trauma every day. But we didn't talk about hospice. We worked adjacent to hospice. And I think part of it is just because we're always on this curative path and that hospice is sometimes seen as a failure or a defeat, but it's not. The goal of hospice is to achieve a good death. And the goal too is to talk about it. Um, I personally, my husband's an ICU nurse, my mom's a hospice nurse, 
we are in joy at the Thanksgiving table. We come with a lot of exciting stories, but we don't talk about it. I know very limited things, but we only talk about death when it touches us personally. And we talk about it in kind of a comparative measure. If so-and-so did this, I don't really want this for myself. Or the memorial service was here, I don't want it in a church. That's how we talk about it. We don't formulate plans. And I think that's why these two slides kind of kept me up at night, which it did, um, because I wasn't sure how to introduce the conversation in a way that's meaningful and proactive and not a dirty word, right? We should be having these conversations with patients when they're diagnosed with a life-limiting diagnosis, not as a sign of defeat or that we're not going to try to cure them, but that this is something that should be brought on board before the last week of their death. So just as the general overview, it doesn't prolong or postpone dying, but the goal is to achieve a good death, a comfortable death, and a death that's handled in a dignified manner. Um, this is the part that's scary, and this is a conversation that we often stumble upon. When we're talking hospice care, the patient relinquishes access to curative interventions. Um, the goal is that they live out the remainder of the days peacefully at home or in a hospice facility with minimal medical intervention. But what I learned in nursing school and what many of us experience on a daily basis is the goal of hospice is to be brought on about six months to end of life, and we're bringing it on within the last three to five days. So we're not achieving the good death. We're achieving a hugely anxiety-ridden last few days as we're also trying to meet these goals. Now let's talk about palliative care because it's slightly different and it's almost said in the same hushed tones as hospice when really it can be brought on board while also pursuing curative treatments. So this is this bullet point I'm going to read word for word, but it's so important. Not all of palliative care is hospice care, but hospice care is palliative care. Palliative care can be helpful at any stage of illness and is best provided from the point of diagnosis. So I'm a designated CSM for the government team. Um, it's a slightly different structure than commercial, but I sit on site every day and I sit beside the palliative care nurse manager. So I can hear the conversations that she has. And one, she's never off the phone. She's exhausted by the end of the day, both emotionally. So even though it's not face to face for her all the time, she's constantly hearing about uncontrolled pain measures caretakers that are overwhelmed. All of these support measures that we're trying to bring on board at time of diagnosis, she's hearing when they're almost at the point of crisis, right? The main goal of palliative care is to relieve pain, shortness of breath, nausea, fatigue, constipation, and insomnia. And it also addresses emotional and spiritual concerns for both the patient and the caregiver. So it's this whole team of support that again, Working in chemo, these are all the chemo side effects. So let's bring them on at the time of diagnosis so that we're ensuring that they are controlled to the best of our ability, right? So now we're talking about the goal of the hospice and palliative care build and why we came to this space. So one, the inpatient unit at hospice, sometimes it's empty, sometimes it's full. But that has kind of like babies aren't born nine to five Monday through Fridays, like patients, entering an actively dying stage, it doesn't happen during predictable hours. So Lebanon also had to come up with a solution of where do overflow patients go? Well, they go to short-term rehab, but no offense to short-term rehab, they're not hospice nurses. They don't, they're not as well-versed in this specialty as they are in taking care of the patient and the orders and the body. So one, we were striving for um, continuity of education across all units. We're also trying to address education gaps in hospice. So all of you guys who have Get Well, you know we have education on food, pain, sleep, fatigue, but it doesn't address the hospice patient. It addresses how we're going to manage those figures prior to a safe discharge home, not to manage end of life care, right? We also are using it to promote a relaxing atmosphere and to highlight um, unit and facility-based initiatives such as aromatherapy, mindfulness, and the honors escort. And then lastly, we're also tackling the caregiver practical tasks that are so overwhelming. So in the government sector, we're also making the burial benefits, which is like this much, to be more digestible for the veterans and their family and caregivers. Now here's some unit demographics um, as laid out by the nurse manager for the inpatient hospice team. So one, a little bit different, this inpatient unit has patients um, few days, which is pretty typical, but also runs a gamut of many years. So that's atypical in this build, right? 
demographics, and we've talked about this before with aging populations with Get Well, that the older population, the World War II veteran, they don't know technology, they don't use technology. But we're now trending more towards the Vietnam era veteran who's more familiar with technology. So now we're meeting their unique needs and their family's unique needs. Many of their families are remote, blended, are at work, are having difficulties coming in, so now they're able to consume education during off hours. And then that kind of addresses us both. So as you guys go through the conference, and as if you've talked to any of us, we kind of say the same thing is required for successful get well use, and that's people, process, and technology. Um, the next few slides are just gonna kind of talk about the build and where we got to where we were, addressing those three points, but also kind of the requirements for the successful build. One, leadership and clinical end user buy-in. If you don't have buy-in, it's never gonna be successful. It's never gonna complement work. It's gonna be viewed as something that's supposed to take over, and that's not how it is. Subject matter experts, valuable up-to-date or evidence-based practice, and then in-place patient-facing technology, which we had. So describing the people outside of Get Well, this is Lebanon VA's inpatient hospice care team, their outpatient palliative care team, and then the interprofessional care team that I interact with on a daily basis. One thing to note, Dr. Shreve, he's the National Director of Hospice and Palliative Care Program for the Department of Veteran Affairs. They have a very robust inpatient program, but he also too then collaborates on a national level. Karen Stewart, who is not able to be here today, who I'm presenting on her behalf, and then additionally, social work, chaplain services, burial benefits was a huge part of this. Um, psych, the nursing staff, and then also the palliative care team, which kind of reflects the same roles. So this is a little bit difficult to see, but this kind of discusses the timeline of the build. We started discussions for this in February of last year when I was face to face with all the CLC and hospice nurse leaders and we were talking more about kind of our deficits and what we didn't have. So we acknowledged a while ago that we didn't have quality hospice video education that was specific to the hospice patient. So again, we had videos on food and we had videos on pain and sleeping, but nothing that addressed specifically the hospice patient and why it was gonna look different. Then over many, many months, so February through August, we just did constant collaboration. We met face to face. We did all any form of communication we handled. And what we were trying to address is how we can build this within our current structure to address all of the needs. Lastly, we went live late August. Um, In-person staff training took place in September, highlighted at a internal quality fair for staff members. And then in December, I'll speak later to this, they brought on some supplemental content which address some of the ongoing needs. Lastly, our outcome priorities are patient satisfaction and then reporting metrics are both on how many times the tile is entered and video completion rates for certain um, video categories. So in September when we did the training for the staff, um, one pagers were developed and handed out and then we were working with them, um, live trainings, live trainings for both the hospice unit and then the short-term rehab who are gonna be using this the most. We were lucky in that GetWell was already installed. GetWell has been live at Lebanon for about six years and this came in about five years later. And GetWell was in the inpatient hospice units as well. It just was used more for the entertainment options for family and caregivers. Um, and as ways to try to promote relaxation at end of life. Further, we, um, we do quarterly updates and trainings. So we continue to speak to this and we continue to change the content as it becomes um, evident that needs to be changed or updated. So we do it for CLC update days, nurse managers council and palliative care improvement committee. Okay, now the stuff that's easy to talk about. So this is the build itself. Um, it is, you enter, it's a favorite tile space, right? So when looking at GetWell Network itself down here, it's a permanent fixture within this 15 tile carousel. In the inpatient hospice unit, it's fixed front and center. So as you scroll through the carousel, the tile at space is always right there. The landing page, um, it invites the person, oftentimes this family or caregiver in to learn more. 
but the wording itself is kind of geared more towards its collaborative nature. It's an honor for us to care for you or your loved one. We invite you to learn more, but please, if you have any questions, seek us out face to face. So again, it was always meant to be collaborative. And then it opens up to this eight tile space um, orderable menu. And what this whole tile space tries to address is four areas. Physical comfort for the patient, mental and emotional needs, spiritual issues, and practical tasks. So generally speaking, those are the four areas that are, are in need or need to be addressed at end of life. And then the practical task is for family and caregiver support because it is super overwhelming. To address physical comfort, we, we mostly focus on mindfulness, knowing that IV pain medication and PO pain medication is on board. We try to focus on alternative methods for pain control. Um, talk about their aromatherapy program, which they have on board. And this too kind of speaks to the continuity of care across all units. So if you have an inpatient hospice patient who overflows the short term, this kind of highlights some of the unit-based initiatives that are present within the facility that they may not know not being within the unit themselves. Further, we have guided meditation and breathing videos, um, mostly Again, for the family, for the stressed out caretaker, for the wife, for the husband, but things that can be done at bedside too. So soft belly breathing, chair yoga, nothing strenuous, all things that don't require getting out of the hospital bed. Additionally, ways that we tackle the mental, emotional, and spiritual needs are twofold. One, we highlight chaplain services that are available within the facility. We talk about different chapel times, but we also try to point out that if you're in spiritual distress or believe that death is near, please don't use the system. That's meant for face-to-face -face interaction. Please bring on nursing so that we can um, call the on-call chaplain through the hospital system. So again, this is meant to complement and not replace. In terms of um, mental and emotional needs, we utilize something called the Windows Channel, which was a package that was already within our contract. Um, one of the things that was highlighted way back in February is that the nursing staff was using YouTube playlists to try to reduce stimulation, but YouTube's free content, right? So that was a learning moment. So at time of death, they may have classical music playing, but then a commercial for Acura interrupts it, right? So that's not soothing at all. So it, it was totally an education learning point that actually you guys have these relaxation videos and it's paid content. So there's no embedded advertisements and these videos can last from 40 minutes to 11 hours long. So it was just another way that although this was present in the system, we tried to put it into one place that was easy to find. When talking about the family and caregiver resources, we tackled two different parts of it. We tackled what the family or caregiver needs in terms of grief support and then what they need in terms of burial planning. One thing to mention that I didn't mention before is the goals of care resources that are part of the family and caregiver tile space. Unfortunately, sometimes your first exposure to death is the first time that you think about your own death, right? So what this, we embedded um, life sustaining treatment decision initiative within the family and caregiver resources but we did the full build. So we talked about mechanical ventilation, we talked about CPR, we talked about all the things that the hospice patient chose not to do when they entered hospice, but just to <laughs> highlight, these are decisions that you're gonna have to make in your own life as well. And if you're curious, this is what this is, right? Also talks about living will, power of attorney, advanced directives. So it tries to give you that full picture. Um, one thing that I didn't point out is we have a goals of care resource for the hospice patient, but it's specific to living will, advanced directives, and power of attorney. We took out all other life-saving treatment decision options, right? Um, further, we have grief. We have grief resources, both physical resources, and then we attached um, online resources as well. And then the burial planning. So as a clinician who can read through a lot of the fluff, it was an overwhelming amount of materials, right? And it's a source of stress. So what I tried to do when helping create this was put it in layman's terms and really condense it. Not so that they're making the decisions through the system, but so that they're not completely overwhelmed and are digesting it in one to two paragraphs. Um, additionally, at the bottom of the build, 
are some VA Memorial Benefits videos that we were able to embed as well. So if reading becomes arduous, it's not your style of learning, we also have some VA content at the bottom. And then lastly, this is supplemental content, and this is something that Lebanon chose to do additionally to what was available to them. So prior to me coming on as their CSM, they were already using physical resources from Barbara Carnes, which is a hospice nurse group. Um, short pamphlets, again, pretty easy to digest. But what Lebanon chose to do was also um, purchase a digital file for a 25 minute DVD that highlights the themes that we weren't able to cover with traditional videos. So this is, it's talking about food, it's talking about sleep, it's talking about withdrawal, pain management, and it's just also talking about the general transition uh, from living to death, right? So it's, it's hard, it's stressful information, but it also kind of plays to what Get Well at the Heart is trying to do. We're trying to meet family and caregivers where they're at. And maybe in the middle of the night, this is where they're at and where they can watch a video. So it is on every TV. Um, it's, a good, it's good, it's easy to watch, it's just the themes are very hard. So we just make it available at bedside um, and then the goal too is to put it in the day room if they're more comfortable consuming this information away from their loved one. So here's utilization and reporting metrics. Um, on the left is the hospice and palliative care favorite tile and what this is showing is selection rates. So it's how many unique times the tile space is being entered on a facility level each month. Um, and then on the right, you're seeing video category completion rates. You can, s it's advanced directives if you're unable to read, hospice and palliative care and then healing videos. So it, one thing that is being heavily used is that Windows channel. So that was a good education opportunity to let them know that they do have the babbling brooks and the crackling fireplaces available to them. Um, yeah, of course. The Windows channel. I feel. I think you have to contact for that separately with the Windows channel. Is that what the contract is? Per contract. It's also good, take this aside, it's also good if you think about other situations where you need to kind of decrease stimulation, like pick line insertions. Um, it's a really nice resource to have. So here are the outcomes that we are, um, we collected baseline data of 12 months before Go Live, and now we're collecting post-implementation utilization data with projected improvement outcomes in the following areas. Um, we expect to see an increase in access to care, care coordination, employee engagement, technology and processes, clinical operation in nurse practice environments, standardization of care, and communication with veterans. So this is, I'm gonna point, this is Lebanon. This is Karen who is unable to be here today. Um, and this is the hospice unit itself. So when Karen realized that she wasn't gonna be able to um, present on her own behalf, she wrote a little bit of a um, snippet that I'm just gonna share with you guys, okay? Because it is a little bit hard to read. The partnership between Lebanon VA and Get Well Network helped expose all of us to the wonderful resources available, especially from Barbara Carnes. I really believe that for some of our veterans and their families, the inclusion of the new rules for end of life on the platform has been a real game changer. This population also has some distinctive needs that were not consistently being addressed elsewhere, sleep, relaxation, and meditation. Truth is, it is not always easy to talk about or hear the types of things that need to be talked about at end of life. The Get Well Network Hospice and Palliative Care Bill doesn't solve all of these problems, but it does help to empower the veteran and their family to become a better advocate for themselves and their loved ones. 
while giving back a little of the control that the disease has stripped away from them. So that's our goal in a nutshell. As someone presenting on behalf of Get Well, that's it. Like we wanna meet the family and the caregivers and the patients where they're at and we wanna address their needs. Okay, lessons learned. Um, education, discussion around hospice and palliative care is incredibly sensitive and it's emotional for everyone. It's really uncomfortable or distressing for some. Um, admittedly, during this build, we, we saw that, we experienced that. Some people who just experienced recent death, this was something that they didn't wanna touch at all, right? It's emotional. Um, but it doesn't mean that we should shy away from the conversation, which we all tend to do. Um, the benefit of Get Well is that the information is able to be consumed at the rate that's comfortable for both the patient and their family or caregivers, but it's not meant to replace face-to-face -face interactions in any way. And then for some family and caregivers, they're not comfortable viewing this information around the inpatient hospice patient, and that's where the current in-place technology is. It's only available at bedside. So the goal is to put it in the day room as well. Next steps, a lot of the data collection is done to present this. Um, Lebanon is a Vision 4 and is to present this as a best practice for all Vision 4 locations with Get Well Network. Possible expansion into the non-bedside locations and then to formalize the clinical staff workflows. Um, Karen's feels very strongly that new rules for end-of-life care should be assigned to every patient and viewed, it's not. Um, and to promote greater video completion rates. So since August, um, with the exception of the update days and then the live trainings and me just being available on site as a point person, it's a pretty passive workflow. It's available, it's um, suggested or pointed out to, but there's no formal um, workflow that's been developed to ensure that it's touching every hospice patient. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Thanks so much. I'm uh, Joe from Kaiser, uh, Southern California. Hi. Um, just curious, those tiles, so is that a tile that's available for any patient or is that just in those uh, hospice units? Um, it's available for any patient. It's definitely a turnkey solution for the government facility based on the burial benefits, but based on, it is available. So does that pop up on, if I'm, if I'm there with like a uh, sports injury or something, a yep. you know, knee yep. injury, is that on my uh, home screen? It is. Hospice and palliative care? Yep. Okay. Are there, um, and you, you talked about videos, so are there links to those videos that were created, like the content uh, through, the, through that tile? Yeah, so um, the, another goal of the tile too was to make it less cumbersome for both the clinical user and the family or caregiver in that all of that information, although it's present elsewhere within the build, it's all within the build. So if you are pulling up the band for the caregivers where it lists inpatient hospice and palliative care, at the bottom it's also addressing hospice and palliative care videos. Um, the goals of care resources have all the videos embedded in it. The meditation have videos embedded in it as well. And then are there, in addition to hospice, I don't know if you have other palliative care programs like an outpatient or a home-based palliative care program, are there videos geared towards other programs before hospice or that may lead to hospice for folks who aren't, you know, enrolled in the program yet? No, no, just basic high level overview. Um, a lot of the videos that we pulled from are from .gov resources. So it's hospice for the veteran, it's palliative care for the veteran. Um, and it only touches them when they are inpatient or in the emergency room. And if I'm like an actively dying patient who needs help with uh, pain and want medication adjustment, is there a place for me to click on that or um, you know, if I'm, if I'm asking the RN for a medication adjustment, is there some kind of alert that goes to a nurse or anything like that? No, no. Um, and then I, uh, I saw for like, when folks were asking for chaplain services or aromatherapy, um, things like you know, reach out to staff or please ask your nurse, is there any feedback, like is, there's nowhere, like is there a tile for me to click if I want a chaplain or a click if I want the room with everything and it goes to an alert to someone or do, I ha do, do they have to, once learning about it, actively reach out to the nurse? They have to actively reach out to it. Um, we talked with chaplain services about whether or not they wanted to be alerted via an email system because that's a capability within the government. And just kind of based on the sensitive nature, they 
came up with all worst case scenarios. We don't want the email to sit for a week because we're short staff and it's just sitting there. So the solution was to not to put the onus on the patient or the family or the caregiver, but that if they need something to reach out face to face so that it can be addressed in a timely manner. Yep. And are there resources for guidance for like advanced directive completion, post completion, things like that? There, um, so Lebanon in general, not in general, Lebanon is a, fall, a small facility. Um, a lot of the professionals, social work, pharmacy, everybody rounds on every patient every day. So it's incredibly ambitious, but it's able is what they're able to do. So if they have questions regarding it, it then gets completed face to face. And then how specifically are you going to measure the, those, those outcome metrics that you showed? Is it going to be duration of hospice enrollment? Because that was something you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Or how, what, what are your specific outcome metrics going to be? The specific outcome metrics right now are, so it went live late in August. It really only took off, I'd say, October after that quality fair where we touched all internal um, professionals. Right now, we are simply tracking selection rates and we're tracking um, video completion rates. But some of the build, specifically the burial benefits, are also addressing previous quality survey comments that patients weren't feeling as though they had facing um, materials in a timely manner. So again, it's passive. It's a passive solution to it, but it is trying to address known quality um, outcomes where they have been dinged before. The quality, what is, what is uh, I, sorry, I'm just trying to understand. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. Because uh, it's a very important program evaluation when you're setting something up. So when you're saying quality metrics, you know, a lot of the quality metrics we think about in hospice is the amount of time someone's, you know, been enrolled in hospice before death, um, you know, maybe post completion rates, advanced directive completion rates. Um, so I'm just curious what, what the quality measures you're talking about, is that, I'm curious what that is. I'm sorry. If I'm no, no, that's okay. And I must be being unclear too. It's simply the survey results, the freehand survey, okay. survey results. Yep. I um, did not have access or visibility to the survey itself or what it asked these families. I just know that Karen felt very strongly that we really highlighted in a clear and concise manner the burial benefits because it's another way that they're actively trying to address some of the past survey comments. Okay. So it's going to be a survey based outcome yep. measure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Bridget Carsons from Hampton VA. Um, question for you as far as the family vi viewing the videos in the day room, are you guys still getting credit for those? No, no it's all about numbers. Um, and it's not in the day room. So that is the next goal. We talked about um, at our QBR in November where we want to go with hospice next, and that was something that was continuously raised. Um, no, it wouldn't be documented. Okay. The quantitative data from the reporting in management console, it just wouldn't file back to the patient record. But we're not going to get credit in the patient's chart as far as charting. So a uh, quick question about the, uh, the Brian from Orlando. Hi. Um, nice to meet you. The new rules for end of life mm -hmm. video, is that now available or is that just because Lebanon bought it and it's only available for there? Yeah. And then yeah. how would we make that widespread throughout the VA? <laughs> They're looking at you. Um, we've had a couple <laughs> questions about some of the companies are very small companies. And um, so I think probably the best uh, way to go about it right now would be to individually, um, and it was rel relatively inexpensive to just contract the video or buy the video on your own, and then um, it can be encoded and put on the system. So we d have gone down the route to try to get it system-wide, but just was not successful with that. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Brian was the one who introduced me to the app and how to get points, so he Go Brian, go Brian. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm part of the Hospice and Palliative Care Nurses um, Association in the, ba in the Bay Area. And um, I wondered if you guys had worked with your local HDNA 
um, on anything like that because they, there are a lot of um, programs that they have available. Um, there's actually a new one that's rolled out that's all electronic as well. No, we did not. Um, what we did for this build kind of, not to make it a quick win, but we used videos that were available to us and weren't commercially um, produced. So that for us is anything that was available in the system or ends in a .gov. So on video content, just to make sure we're level setting expectations here is that you have to have um, approval from the vendor in which you purchased it for this type of um, presentation, right? So that's, that's the main thing. Anytime you're gonna procure that, you need to make sure that you have in writing that we're able to upload that to the system and distribute it that way. And that's why we highlighted, um, under the family and caregiver tile space, we highlighted web-based resources from national hospice organizations that they can enter themselves or view at home if they're more comfortable, but we didn't collaborate in any way with them. Point. Uh, just to put anything on locally, that will show that the VA is endorsing a certain agency and you can't have any uh, viewing of us endorsing anything. So it would have to be through a national chapter. So you just can't uh, pick a local agency even though if they're really good and have good material. Hi, I'm Allison from Northern Virginia. Um, so these services are meant to impact the patient and family experience around death. Have you also seen an impact on team member morale around death? I have to say, speaking on behalf of them, and I'm not just saying this because I'm their designated CSM, but Lebanon does a fantastic job in their inpatient hospice unit. Um, some of the buy-in regarding this tile space is they felt very strongly that they were doing it in an intimate face-to-face -face manner already and that these resources weren't necessary. Um, talking during the steering committee brings forth a lot of candid communication and our steering committee at Lebanon tends to be more acute care focused than the extended care and hospice leaders. Um, and it brought forth a lot of really good discussions. Um, I know that when the overflow patients go onto different units, nursing is relieved a little bit that these resources are available and that they're patient facing. Um, but I don't know if I can speak to the team morale that was improved based on it. say I, I've been following you through um, you know get well and I think it's a great um, design you did and we're looking forward to having it at VA New Jersey thank you thank, thank you, you Angie.